right. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all feeling? Everybody feel good? I know we got a lot of people joining us online because there's just a lot of sickness and exposure and all that stuff going on out there. So all of you who are at home because you're not well, I pray the Apostle John's prayer that uh, your health would prosper even as your soul prospers. Uh, but for all of us, would you dig into God's Word with me? All right, find the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And as you're finding that, let me tell you a story from history. It took place in the 17th century in Great Britain. They were having a, a silver shortage, all right, a shortage of silver. And so someone approached the great general and statesman, Oliver Cromwell, and said, sir, there's a shortage of silver in the empire. And he's like, okay, what's the problem? Well, they said, well, that means that we can't mint any coins. So no more coins. So then Cromwell asked, well, where is all the silver? And they said, the only silver to be found is in the statues of the saints in the churches. To which Cromwell famously replied, well, then melt down the saints and put them into circulation. <laughs> so this morning, we're going to look at a story of a man who got uh, melted down, if you will, and put into circulation. His name's Timothy. Here we go right here. Acts chapter 16. Now, Paul also came to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to leave with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the ordinances for them to follow, which had been determined by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. And so the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. So here's the story of how St. Timothy got melted down and put into circulation. Let's get to know Timothy a little bit better, all right? First thing we notice is Timothy is already a disciple of Jesus Christ at this point. Back to verse 1, that he is a disciple. He's already a believer and a follower of Jesus. But it's interesting, really interesting, who his parents are. Let's look. First of all, we notice that his mom was a believer, she was a Jew who was a believer in Jesus. And actually, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, we learn her name. It says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which was first uh, dwelled in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that is in you as well. So there's Timothy's mom, Eunice, and his grandmother Lois. They modeled faith and a life of faith for Timothy. So just to encourage all the moms and grandmas out there, don't quit. Keep praying for your children and your children's children. Faith, I was thinking about this, faith is just one of those things that it's better caught than taught. People will see it, you know, and, and grab hold of it. And so to all you moms and grandmas out there, I just want to encourage you, to all the matriarchs, don't quit. Keep praying for your kids and your, and your grandkids that, and just model a life of faith that they would catch it. Timothy caught it from his mom and his grandma. So he, he was also a believer like his mom and grandma, but then there's a huge contradiction. But it says his father was a Greek. Now you're like, what's so bad about that? What's so bad about being Greek? Well, in, in biblical terminology, this is talking about his dad's not a believer. All right? So you remember, you got it 2,000 years ago, the Greeks believed in many gods. They were pagans. So his dad was a pagan, not a follower of Jesus, not a believer in Jesus, believed in many gods. And the issue was, boys in that culture would almost always follow the religious practices of their dad. So here, he, Timothy has a mom who's a, a Jewish believer, but he's most likely following some of the practices and traditions of a pagan dad. In other words, for example, he didn't get circumcised on the eighth day, as was the Jewish custom. And that's going to come into play here in just a little bit. Now, let me also just use this as a teaching point to all my single friends. If you're single here and you're listening, you're joining us and you're single, Pastor Him loves you, and I just want to encourage you in this. If you're hoping to get married, would you please put number one on your list that he or she is a follower of Jesus Christ. Put that first. Here's why. 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness. 
In other words, you know what a yoke is. That's, that's the, the bar or the frame that you put on the shoulders of a draft animal when you're plowing a field or working a field. Well, sometimes you need two draft animals, and so sometimes there are double yokes. And so that's the image is when you get married, you get yoked together with another person. And obviously, if you're a follower of Christ, you're going this direction. You want to yoke, be yoked up with another person who's going in the same direction following him. How challenging it is, spiritually speaking, if you're a follower of Christ and you're yoked together with someone who's not a follower of Christ, you can just imagine some of the stress and strain with that. Now, if you're already married to someone who's not a believer, I encourage you to stay with them. If they leave, the Bible says you can let them go because we're called to live in peace. But if you're a single person hoping to get married someday, Pastor Him loves you, and I'm just telling you, please, please, please make that the number one priority in your assessment of a potential mate. Make sure that they follow Christ first. Are you with me? Okay. So Timothy's parents were, uh, you could say, religiously and ethnically mixed. But despite that, verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. Lystra, his hometown, and Iconium, the, the town next door. So he had a good reputation both in Alito and in Weatherford. All right? He was, he was well spoken of. And that's pretty special because his daddy was a Greek, but all the churches in his hometown and in the, across town loved him. He had a good reputation, and this is so inspiring. Here's the point, my beloved. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who your daddy is. You get to choose your own reputation by the decisions you make and how you treat people. I read this true story on the internet and I was like, is that really true? So I did some digging, and it is. It's a story of a guy named Ben Hooper. He was born, I believe, in 1870 to a mom named Sarah Wade. But nobody knew who his dad was. And in 1870, in a small town in Tennessee, that was a big deal. And so Ben grew up in Tennessee. He was placed in an orphanage, I believe, in Knoxville for a while. But eventually, they moved back to his hometown where he grew up. And growing up, the son with a single mom with no knowledge of who your dad is was a big deal in a small town in ten Tennessee in the late 1800s. He was mercilessly picked on, made fun of. He was the kid, hey, kids who are in school, maybe you can think of the kid at school who, when it's recess time, he's by himself. At lunchtime, he eats by himself. That kid, that was Ben Hooper. Until one Sunday... His mom drags him to church, and these are Ben's own words of what took place next. He said, one Sunday, some people queued up in the aisle before I could get out. Has that ever happened to you right here? All right. And I was stopped. Before I could make my way through the group, I felt a hand on my shoulder, a heavy hand. It was that minister. You ever had that happen here too? All right. <laughs> He said, I cut my eyes around and caught a glimpse of his beard and his chin, and I knew who it was. I trembled in fear. He turned his face around so he could see mine and seemed to be staring for a little while. I knew what he was doing. He was going to make a guess as to who my father was. A moment later, he said, well, boy, you're a child of, and then he paused and I knew it was coming. I knew I would have my feelings hurt. I, I knew I would not go back again. But then he said, boy, you're a child of God. I see a striking resemblance. Then he swatted me on my bottom and said, now go claim your inheritance. Ben said, I left the building a different person that day. In fact, that was really the beginning of my life. Ben Hooper went on to become the two-term governor of Tennessee, 1911 and 1915. Because you see, beloved, ultimately, it doesn't matter who your daddy is. You get to make a reputation and a name for yourself by the decisions you make and how you treat people. You want to make a good reputation? Here's how to do it. The Bible tells you. It's in the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Real simple. It says, do not let kindness and truth leave you. 
bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. That's how to do it. The key to building a good reputation is kindness and truth. And notice, it says, not just to have them kind of sometimes, but to to let kindness and truth be a consistent part of your life. Bind them around your neck. That's a, a permanent fixture, like that tie that you just can't get off, right? And write them on the tablet of your heart. That's in stone. That's chiseled in stone. That's not a dry erase board where sometimes you're kind and sometimes you're truthful with this group, but then you go over here and it's like... And then you're a completely different person in this other group. No, kindness and truth are chiseled in the stone of your character. So regardless of who you're with or where you are, you are kind and truthful consistently. And that's how to build a good reputation. Yesterday, we had a memorial service for a lady who did this. And every single person I met yesterday up here said the same thing. She was so kind. She was so joyful. Didn't matter who, from what circle, from where she was, May May we called her, was kind and truthful. And so that's why the room was packed with people who loved her because she was consistently kind and truthful. And that's how to gain a good reputation with God and man. And that's what Timothy did. And so that's why, verse 3, Paul wanted this man to leave with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So I need to explain this. In the context in the previous chapter, Paul had been traveling around the world with Barnabas. You heard of him. Paul and Barnabas had been together traveling the world telling people about Jesus. But then they had a bit of a tiff. Barnabas wanted to take along this guy named John Mark, and Paul did not because John Mark had deserted them previously. And so Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance. Paul was like, "Uh uh-uh, one strike and you're out. So Barnabas is like, come on, let's take him. Paul's like, nope, come on, nope, come on, nope. So if two women have a cat fight, do two men have a dog fight? I don't know. What it is. I don't know. They're having a dog fight, all right? And so they disagree. And so the Barnabas is like, fine, I'm just going to take John Mark and we're going to go off by ourselves. And so that left Paul alone. And Paul's smart enough to know, I don't want to travel the world alone. I need a traveling buddy. So he comes into the, in Timothy's hometown. He learns of his good reputation and says, I want you. Would you be my traveling companion? Would you be my fellow missionary? And Timothy agrees. And then interestingly enough, the first thing that they do is circumcise Timothy. Now we're in church, so we've got to keep it holy, but also this is in the scriptures, so we've got to keep it true. Here is a, Timothy's a young man, but he's a grown man, and he willingly gets circumcised. Hello? Why? Because all the Jews in that area knew that his daddy was a Greek. And so in order to reach the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Timothy became a Jew. This is the spirit of what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, for though I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may gain more. To the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might gain Jews. To the weak, I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might save some. Timothy got circumcised as a grown man in order to reach the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that hit me, I got to be honest with you, that challenged me. It's like he was willing to do that to reach the lost in his community. What am I willing to do? How much do I really love those around me who are lost? How much do I really love Jesus? How much do I really love and believe in the gospel? What am I willing to do to reach those around me? I'll tell you a little about me. Uh, When God called Beth and me out here in May of 1999, I was a city kid, okay? I grew up in Dallas. And, And when you grow up in the public school system in Dallas, the only people who have guns are the gangs. All right, and country music is what they played at the end of our school dances in order to get us to leave. All right, true story. And so then I didn't even own a pair of boots. So then God calls us out here, and I'm sitting in my office twiddling my thumbs. We were small church back then, and I'm how do I reach the men of Parker County? So I ask a dude, 
how do I reach the men of Parker County? He's like, well, you got to learn to shoot guns. Okay. So I went and shot some guns. And you know what? I kind of liked it. And so I went to a gun show with a police officer in our church, bought me a gun. And then I bought another one and another. Now I have several. Don't come to my house uninvited. All right. <laughs> and I own boots. I like boots. And I even learned to like country music. Now, if I listen to it too long, I get sad. <laughs> and I feel my IQ slip just a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I like it. Cody Johnson's probably our family favorite guy. I've been to several of his concerts. Always shares Jesus. Anyway, there you go. So I didn't change who I am. I didn't change my convictions my beliefs, but I adapted to the culture around me so that I could win some to Jesus Christ. That's the spirit of this. May I ask you, what are you doing? What are you willing to sacrifice? How are you willing to adapt to reach those in your circle of influence with the good news of Jesus? That's the spirit of Timothy. Okay, now it's time for Paul and Timothy to start their travels together. Verse 4. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the ordinances for them to follow, which had been determined by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. And so the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Okay, I love that. Let's take it verse by verse. So they were delivering the ordinances established in the previous chapter, which Eric so beautifully preached on last week in chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. Remember, this is Jews and Gentiles now coming to faith in Jesus, the Messiah. Now they're one in one church, but from completely different backgrounds. And so they were just trying to decide, how do we live life together as one church united in Christ from such different backgrounds? That's what the Jerusalem Council was all about. And so they made decisions, Eric beautifully summarized, in order to guard first the purity of the gospel, and then secondly, to guard the unity of the church. That's what they did. That's what the ordinances were all about. And so they're going around delivering these ordinances, and the church, it says, I love this in verse 5, two things. First of all, they're being strengthened in the faith, and then secondly, that they're increasing in number daily. So let's take each of those phrases. They're being strengthened in the faith. That word strengthened, the root word in the original language for strengthened is the word we get our word steroids from, all right? So when you think of steroids, what people take to get strong, right? That word literally means to become hard or solid. I'd be glad to demonstrate it for you, but I got a long sleeve shirt on. Sorry, man. And if you believe that, anyway. So that's what steroids is. That's what it means to be strong. And really, beloved, that's the role. As a fellow elder, may I exhort all my fellow elders and all the other pastors and all the other leaders of all the other churches, that's our job is to strengthen the church in its faith. When I was in college, I watched Saturday Night Live back when it was funny and not as political. And there was this skit I long remember. It was Hans and Franz. You guys remember Hans and Franz? It was Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon, and they, you know, stuffed themselves, which is what I would have to do too. And their famous line was, we're going to pump you up. Oh, you remember it. Can we all do that together? Ready? We're going to pump you up. Okay. That's my job. That's why I preach. I'm here to pump you up in your faith. I'm here to remind you that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in Christ Jesus. That those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And that's you, my beloved. God's got this and God's got you. Be strengthened in your faith. History is simply the unfolding of God's master plan. It may look like chaos from your perspective, but from his, it's a beautiful task. Tapestry. God's got this. Be strengthened in your faith. That's why I preach. I'm here to pump you up. <laughs> and I love this. They were increasing in number daily. Daily, the church was growing. Why was the church growing? Because people were church shopping and hopping 
Nope. Was it because the, the believers left all the work of the ministry to the paid professionals? Nope. The church was growing daily because individual believers were willing to be melted down and put into circulation. And as they went about in their own circles of influence, they told people about their personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. That's how the kingdom grew in the first century, and that's how it still grows today. Check out this video that captures a true story. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. How is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James. He was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. And in that cool story, that's how the kingdom of God expands when people are simply willing to be, if you will, melted down and put into circulation. I want to close by telling you a true story from my life. Uh, I did not grow up in a Christian home, and uh, I was never taught how to study the Bible, all right? But when I graduated college, I felt called uh, into the ministry, and so I went to seminary. And the very first class I ever took at Dallas Theological Seminary is my favorite all-time class in the history of my educational life. It was called Bible Study Methods and Hermeneutics. And it was taught by this man, Howard Hendricks. He's now with the Lord. But for over 50,
sorry. Dang it. For over 50 years, he taught people how to study the Bible, including me. I didn't know. So he taught me how to study the Bible, and the truth is, for the past 30 years of ministry, I've been a pastor 30 years, for the past 30 years, every sermon I've ever given has its beginning with a Bible study that he taught me. So if I've ever said anything that's encouraged you or pumped you up (laughs) in the faith, it's all because that guy taught me how. Now, here's his story. When he was nine years old, he was outside playing with marbles. Kids, that's what we did before video games, all right? And so he's outside playing with marbles. I'm shooting marbles right now. Some of you don't even know what I'm doing. Uh, Anyway, and this man comes along and invites him to Sunday school. And Howie, that's what friends called him, Howie's like, he hears the word school. He's like, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with school. So then the man realizes, man, I need, I need to take a different approach with this kid. So then the man says, how about I play in a game of marbles? And he goes, okay. So they play a game of marbles, and the man smokes him. And he says, you want to play again? And he goes, yeah. They play again. The man smokes him again. So then the man says, how about this? How about I come back tomorrow, I'll bring my own marbles, and I'll teach you how to play marbles better. Howie goes, okay. So the next day, the man comes back, brings his marbles, They play marbles. He teaches them how to play marbles better. And he does it the next day and the next day. And by the end of the week, how his own testimony is, that guy could have asked me to go anywhere and I would have followed him. They built a relationship. So that man invites Howie to a Sunday school class where he had also met and recruited 11 other boys. So now there are 12 boys in his class, all of whom he led to Christ. And 11 out of those 12 boys ended up dedicating their lives full-time in Christian service, including Howie Hendricks. So when I get to heaven, I'm looking up the man with the marbles. Thanks, man. Thanks for being willing to just get melted down and put into circulation. And my beloved, you could be the man with the marbles too if you would do the same in someone else's life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the saints who have gone before us, and and even still today we find inspiration in their story, in their sacrifice and in their service and their willingness to be melted down and put into circulation. And I pray that that spirit would just infuse our church family, that in our own circles of influence that our personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, as we fellowship with your Holy Spirit and keep in step with your Holy Spirit, that your fruit, that the grace uh, of God through Jesus Christ would just pour out of our lives and and those whom we just come in contact with. Lord, may, may we be the man with the marbles in someone else's life. I'm thinking of the next generation especially as we reach the next generation with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, melt us down and put us into circulation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.